Okay, I think everybody's in now. So uh, I'll just take this opportunity before the conference kicks off to say good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Yvonne McCarthy and I'm the current chair uh, for this year of the organising committee for the Dublin Economic Workshop Annual Conference. And before we get stuck into the conference, I just would like to take the opportunity on behalf of the committee uh, to officially welcome you all to the conference this year and to say a few quick thank yous. So this is the second year that we have hosted this event through a virtual format. And while, of course, we miss interacting with all of you in person, we are nonetheless delighted to have the opportunity to come together as a group to discuss pressing policy relevant economic issues. The conference sessions will be recorded throughout the week and available afterwards to anyone who might like to access them. I would like to thank the Dublin Chamber of Co Commerce, who are our sponsor again this year and whose support has made this event possible and I would also like to thank the organising committee for their dedication to getting this event over the line at this challenging time and particularly I'd like to thank Maeve McGrath from Trinity College Dublin who has supported the setup and logistics of the conference again this year. Finally, I want to extend huge gratitude to all of our stellar speakers who are with us this year, uh, kicking off today, and of course, to all of our participants and chairs. We're so grateful to have you here with us. Uh, thank you. And I very much look forward to a week of great insight and discussion. I'll hand you over now to Rona Lyons, who's going to uh, kick off the first session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And it's, it's my pleasure to be the chair or MC for the, the first of the DW talks. Um, technically, it's the Cantillon Lecture, so the Cantillon Medal is presented each year at the Dublin Economic Workshop to recognise a contribution to, to research, expertise and innovative thought in a particular area of economic policymaking over a sustained period. The Cantillon Lecture was set up to recognise the Kerry roots of the Dublin Economic Workshop's annual conference, so as many of you will know, it was held not in Dublin but in Kerry for many decades. Um, Richard Cantillon was born in Ballyhague in Kerry in the 1680s and is regarded as one of the founding figures in economics with early and important contributions in areas such as monetary economics, political economy, entrepreneurship and, relevant for today, spatial economics. This year's recipient of the Cantillon Medal, virtually for the moment, although we'll, we'll bring him over at some point in the near future, is Professor Edward Glazer of Harvard University. Um, so Edward Glazer is the Fred and Elmer Lim Professor of Economics and the, the Chair of the Department uh, of Economics at Harvard, where he's taught microeconomic theory and occasionally urban and public economics since 1992. Uh, he's published dozens of papers on cities' uh, economic growth, um, uh, on law and economics, and in particular, his work is focused on the determinants of city growth and the role of cities as centers of ideas transmission. So with that in mind, with everything that's happened over the past couple of years, we're delighted um, that he's uh, been able to join us today and talk about the future of cities and work um, after COVID. So uh, Professor Glazer, I'll hand over to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you so much for including me in this. I'm, I'm really very honored and very grateful for this. Um, what an amazing time to be to be an urban economist to study to study cities, um, I want to start this uh, this talk with a slide which would have been the sort of slide that I would have begun almost every talk that I gave between let's say 2011 and 2019, and it, this is a it's a figure that reflects the European Union, the 1,114 nuts three regions of the European Union, and I've ordered those regions on the basis of their density level because at their heart. Cities are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. The blue line shows the relationship between GDP per capita and density. And as you can see, the densest tenth of these regions have incomes that are twice as high than the least dense half of these regions. Um, some part of that may be selection of, you know, better educated people or better trained people moving into uh, dense cities. Some part of it may be local features like a harbor or a coal mine that creates productivity and brings people in. But over the past 30 years, economists who have studied these uh, relationships, which we typically call agglomeration economies, have settled down on a consensus that at least some significant fraction of this ref reflects a treatment effect of density, reflects the fact that we become more productive when we are thrown into a maelstrom of, of economic activity. The red line shows perhaps a slightly more surprising fact, which is the relationship between population growth between 2000 and 2010. 
an initial density level. And while there is a little bit of bumpiness, the overall pattern still should be clear that the denser parts of the European Union were adding people more quickly than the least dense parts. That instead of spreading out as Americans were at the start of the 19th century, leaving their dense enclaves on the Eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, at least before COVID struck, we were clustering in. Now, the urbanization phenomenon is even more amazing in the developing world uh, where billions have urbanized over the past 50 years. And it is often easy to look at slums, townships, favelas, the poor informal settlements in the developing world and just think this is hell. But you can't compare it with Dublin on a lovely fall day, right? You need to compare it with the life that they've left behind of rural poverty. And it's certainly true that the income differences, the infant mortality differences, all of show that coming to the city actually makes a certain amount of sense. Now, perhaps the, the rawest form of, of this evidence is the gap in happiness between urban and rural dwellers. So what each one of these dots shows is it's, it's the happiness gap. So it's the self-reported life satisfaction of city dwellers versus rural dwellers. If the dot is positive, it means who the people who live in cities say that they're happier. If the dot is negative, it means the people who live in the country say that they're happier. Now, what you can see is in the rich countries of the world, there's virtually no difference between urban and rural happiness. It's really about the same. Um, in the poor countries, though, Rwanda, Mali, India, Ghana, Moldova, there there's a huge happiness gap and it favors cities. There are some exceptions, Iraq and Thailand. Iraq was being bombed during this time period. Thailand, I blame on, on the traffic jams. So it's even though Mumbai slums have a great deal of work to do before they become healthy, before they become uh, really livable areas, there is a promise, there's hope in urban density that is just not there in rural poverty. Cities are the only pathway I know out of poverty and prosperity for the poorest parts of this world. And of course, another indication of the demand for city space is the rise in housing prices. So um, over the past 40 years in many of our most successful cities, including Dublin, uh, housing prices have risen more quickly than incomes have. This partially reflects the demand for city space as places to just consume, to be, to be around other people. And here you can see just the enormous disparity in price to income ratios in different parts of England, uh, where there's just, you know, in London, it's just wildly expensive relative to what people earn there, partially because cities are places of pleasure as well as productivity. And then all of a sudden, pandemic struck. This is a painting done by a follower of the French Baroque artist Nicolas Poussin, and it's meant to capture a classical plague, perhaps the plague of Cyprian, perhaps uh, the plague of Antoninus Pius, um, but I'm going to use it to try and connote the plague of Athens, which is our first well-documented urban plague. So the backstory behind the plague of Athens is think about 5th century BCE in this you know, great Greek city where talent has come in from throughout the Mediterranean world and it has prospered. People have learned from each other. Incredible breakthroughs have been made in architecture, in drama, in democracy itself, in philosophy, in sculpture, right? This city is doing all that you could possibly ask a city to do, enabling smart people to learn from one another. And in its success, military, economic, as well as cultural, it excites the envy of its uh, more rural counterpart, Sparta, the traditional military power in, in Greece. A challenge is sent out. And Pericles, the leader of Athens, decides to fight back. He has a cunning strategy, whereas he will summon all the Athenians and their allies behind the walls of the city, which he trusts will protect them against the Spartan warriors, the hoplites. And then he will send out the superior Athenian fleet to harass the coast of the Spartan uh, peninsula, the Peloponnese. The strategy is perfectly sound militarily, but even though the walls can keep out the warriors, the walls can't keep out the bacteria that enters in through the port of Piraeus which gives us the first reason why cities are so vulnerable. They are the nodes on our global lattice of trade and transport. And just as it was for New York in 2020, as visitors from Europe, American tourists returning from Italy, brought in COVID-19, so it was in Athens in 430 BC. We don't know exactly what this plague was, but for two years it raged through the city, partially also because cities are defined by their density. And so that makes it easy for a virus to go from a person to person, just as it makes it easy for an idea to go from a person to person. And so, you know, roughly a quarter of the city's population dies over two years. It soldiers on for 25 more years in the Peloponnesian War before finally being defeated by Sparta. But in 
essence, the golden age of Athens is over. It is destroyed by this disease, which rocks it from its pedestal. No longer would it be the New York City of the Mediterranean world. It would perhaps become its Boston, and then perhaps its, its Cambridge eventually, uh, far lower down on the urban pecking order. Uh, plagues would then come back. You had about 500 years of relatively plague-free times in the Mediterranean. They came back during the Roman Empire in the second and third uh, centuries. But then the truly devastating one occurred in 541, when in the 530s, the Emperor Justinian was preparing to reimpose the Pax Romana on the Mediterranean world to end the period of, of chaos that occurred after the fall of Rome and send forth his warlord Belisarius to reconquer Italy and North Africa. Everything was going well until Yersinia Pestis, the Black Death, makes its first appearance on Euro European shores in 541 CE, right? Utter chaos. And that reminds us in some sense that the impact of a natural disaster is always mediated by the strength of civil society when it stri strikes. And because the fate of Europe already hung on the edge of a knife in 541, it just took that extra little bit of plague to push it over. For two more centuries, the plague would wreak havoc on Europe and plunge all of Europe into what many have called the Dark Ages. Now, for most of the past 650 years, however, our urban systems have proved far more robust. I will return back to the medieval Black Death later on in, in the lecture, but in the 19th century, we had plenty of urban plagues. We first had yellow fever in the early decades. This is a mosquito-borne uh, virus that comes out of uh, Africa, come, makes its way through the Caribbean, and wreaks havoc on the cities of the eastern seaboard in the early decades of the 19th century. And then we have cholera, which emerges in a particularly virulent form in the Ganges Delta in 817, uh, and then works its way across India, across Asia, by land, across Russia, uh, and then finally over water, uh, to the cities of the, of the new world, right? These were far deadlier than COVID-19, and yet people kept on coming to cities because they were poor and because they would risk the disease uh, for the sake of, of finding some sort of a better future. They also, cities also survived these diseases because they learned how to become more effective. Um, because governments learned how to take care of their own. And in fact, in the third chapter of my new book, uh, Survival of the City, uh, I tell about how city governments in both the US and, and the UK um, came together to make these investments. And I see this as being the hinge of history where governments ceased to be solely agents of death, which they pretty much were prior to 1800 and actually became agents that actually gave life as well through sewers and, and aqueducts and through incentives as well as through infrastructure. You can see here that the Croton Aqueduct is built in 1842, but New York continues to have cholera outbreaks for another 25 years because they don't actually have rules in place that require the tenement owners to connect to the water. It's not until the 1866 Board of Health that starts fining people, essentially imposing Pigouvian taxes on those people who don't connect, that you have the incentives that go along with infrastructure and then the, uh, the health of the city starts getting better. This, there's a, a sign here that actually we need to make real investments going forward to keep our city safe. And we also uh, need to recognize that this is not gonna be free. America's cities and towns were spending as much on water and sewers at the start of the 20th century as our national government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. Now we have had a blessed century that has been free of urban pandemic. The, the last one was 1918, 1919 with the influenza pandemic. And then all of a sudden we got this. Once again, airborne disease, much like 1918, 1919, comes to uh, the cities of the world. It enters through our ports. And as of April, it is a very urban plague. You can see there's New York, there's Boston, New Orleans, Atlanta, very much a city-oriented place because those are the ports of entry. This is the relationship between population density and the spread of the disease as of April. But an airborne pandemic, as opposed to a waterborne pandemic like cholera can spread easily everywhere, right? You can pretty much protect yourself by cholera if you disconnect anything that you're drinking from anyone who might have cholera. So if you're in a, a dispersed farm, you're very unlikely to get the disease. But an influenza-like airborne disease can spread everywhere. And here you can see by November, 2020, it was the Dakotas, some of the lowest density parts of America that were most afflicted uh, with the disease. Other countries also saw the disease strike first into their urbanites, particularly their, their poorer urbanites who lived in informal settlements. This shows the relationship across Brazilian uh, metropolises between the share of the population that lives in a favela or a shanty town and the number, the share of people who had received the, who had had the disease by June, 2020. 
So again, it would eventually get everywhere, but it struck cities first. This shows the relationship between the spread of infections and the share of the population living in slums in India. The remarkable work of Anup Malani and his co-authors found that by July 2020, more than 50% of the residents of Mumbai slums had already had COVID-19. So this is a year and four months ago, they already had reached 50% of people getting the disease. Remarkably, death rates were relatively low because the residents of Indian slums were young and they were thin. And so they didn't die uh, very much from it. Now within New York, density was actually negatively associated with getting the disease. This is a map of New York City. And I don't know how many of you know this, know this map, but this, this area over here, this whitish area, that's Manhattan. That's where the tallest buildings are. That's where the fewest numbers of cases are. Over here, this is Brooklyn Heights. Again, fairly high density, again, fairly low cases. Out here, this is the Bronx, this is uh, outer Queens, this is Staten Island. These are the lowest density parts of the city, and these are the places where they have the most cases, okay? Cases were actually negatively associated with density within the city of New York. Now, what's the explanation for this puzzle? It's all about behavior. It's all about how people respond to the, to the COVID pandemic. And this shows the change in mobility during the early months of the plague across different parts of New York. And you can see, Downtown Manhattan is where they stopped moving around most. Brooklyn Heights comes next. The outer areas, they moved less. This graph shows the, oh, this graph shows the relationship between the change in the number of trips and the share of people getting the disease. My own work on this finds that a 10% reduction in the number of trips during these early months was associated with a 20% reduction in the prevalence of the disease. That's unlikely to be a permanent fact. This was before we all knew, knew to wear masks, um, but it does show how important reductions um, mobility were. Now, we shouldn't think all of a sudden that the Manhattanites were virtuous uh, and smart and the people in the outer boroughs were not. That was not the difference. The difference was the Manhattanites were richer and they were in industries that enabled them to telecommute, much as we're doing so now. So they were fortunate. And indeed, the work of Raj Chetty, my, my colleague here, finds that in, in the US, almost all of the mortality increase in 2020 occurred amongst poorer Americans. There was basically no mortality increase among the rich. You can see why here. So this comes from the work of Couture Dingle Hanbury. And this again is using cell phone records on mobility. It shows you that before the spread of COVID, people from educated areas were much more mobile than people from less educated areas. They connect more, they travel more. After the disease came, it reversed. Um, and you had much less mobility among the more educated, which reflects their good fortune that they could get someone else to deliver their food for them, that they could continue work via Zoom. Another point that I wanna make with this graph is it was often depicted as if there was a clear trade-off that governments got to make between the economy and our health. That was a foolish thought because in fact, it was fear, not government lockdown that shut down mobility. You can really see this. This is a state of emergency. This was non-binding. This is when the, the move, movement really, really stopped, okay? By here, there were some businesses closed, a small light, later effect. The shelter in place had zero impact, okay? So the added rules were not important. What was important was the state of fear. And so we spent far too much time worrying about whether or not the government should uh, have lockdowns or not, when in fact, people were locking down altogether. Um, this just shows our, our identification. This shows the relationship between the share of people in essential industries. This shows the relationship between the change in trips and the share of people who were in industries that enabled you to telework. So if you were an essential industry, like working in a grocery store or working as a nurse in a hospital, then you were much less likely to reduce your number of trips. You were much more likely to get sick. Poor people were more likely to be in essential industries. If you were in an industry that enabled you to telecommute, you were much more likely to reduce your number of trips. Rich people were more likely to be in industries that enabled telecommuting. Now, one of the problems with the COVID pandemic is it struck cities that were already weak. It struck cities that were already in trouble. Um, 20 years ago, when the uh, airplanes hit the Twin Towers of New York, cities very much had a pragmatic consensus that came out of very tough years of the 1970s. And there was a sense in which the city rose or fell together. Over the past 20 years, increasing divisions between rich and poor, between insiders and outsiders have left our cities divided. And you saw the fruits of that division when thousands took to the streets to, to protest the killing of George Floyd, despite the fact that we were in the midst of a, of a pandemic where people were otherwise locking themselves down. So I'm gonna give three examples of those breakdowns. One of which are, is that cities are bringing productivity, but not opportunity. Opportunity is defined by upward mobility for uh, the children of the poor in cities. The second is that successful cities are becoming permanently unaffordable. Uh, that's America's housing failure. And the third is that we are failing to build the space that would enable 
people who have no jobs where they currently live to find jobs in an urban area. Okay, and let me, um, so this shows the relationship on your uh, left-hand side, shows the relationship between per capita GDP and density. So our denser areas are much more productive. The right-hand so side shows the relationship between density and metro area mobility. This is the income percentile in which a child of the 25th percentile parents, meaning that their parents are poorer than three quarters of the parents uh, in America when they're born, it shows where they end up in the income distribution as adults. And as you can see, the denser the metropolitan area, the lower the upward mobility. Um, this shows the relationship between density in, at the tract within cities. So the denser the tract, the lower the upward mobility. And this shows the relationship between distance to the central business district and upward mobility. The farther away you are from uh, the city center, the more the upward mobility. And what's so amazing about this is that for adults, cities aren't static things. Cities are actually forges of human capital. When you see people come to cities, they don't see their wages immediately shoot up. What they experience is year by year, month by month, they experience faster wage growth, which is most compatible with the view that cities are places where you actually learn things and become more productive. But the opposite is true for children, at least in American cities. Um, and one big part of the problem is the underperforming nature of our central city school districts. This is the jump in mobility right at the edge of the central city school district. So if you go to school right outside the city, you are about two percentiles higher as an adult than if you go to school right inside the city. And as an adult, you're about one percentage point less likely to be in jail as an adult if you grow up right outside the central city as opposed to right inside the central city. Another reason for this disparity between kids and adults is that the adults live relatively integrated lives in cities. They, even if they are, wake up in a poor area, they will go to work in a large integrated office. But children who rise in a poor area often go to school in a segregated school. And so they will live a life that is no more integrated than that of a rural village. Um, and this just shows the relationship between segregation and upward mobility for African-Americans. And more segregation means, of course, much less mobility for them. Um, this shows the rise in housing prices. So this was the second failure. Uh, this is the, the inability to provide space. Um, so the denser parts of, of the US have been the ones in which price growth has gone on. That's partially the reflect for cities as places of pleasure, but it's partially also a reflection of a failure for supply to accommodate demand. And this shows the rise in housing prices at the city center as opposed to the edge. Again, robust demand colliding against restricted supply. The power of supply to shape prices is shown by this graph. So what you're looking at along the horizontal axis is the amount of new building. That's the number of building permits issued between 2000 and 2013 as a fraction of the existing housing stock. Along the vertical axis is the gulf between house price and the marginal physical cost of construction. And as you can see, the places that build a lot aren't expensive places like Houston and Atlanta and Orlando and Phoenix, and the places that are expensive don't build a lot, okay? There is no repealing the laws of supply and demand. And if you know Los Angeles and Seattle and Boston want to become more affordable for ordinary people, there's no real answer for that other than permitting more building. The downside of this construction has meant that it has been very, very hard for uh, people to move out of underperforming areas. Before COVID-19 struck, I was convinced that this was America's largest unsolved social problem, the rise in prime age joblessness, which follows, it happened after the rise of prime age joblessness in the European Union. But when I was a boy in 19, born in 1967, only one in 20 prime age men were jobless. Um, over the past 10 years, more than 15% of prime age men have been jobless. And that is most certainly not spatially neutral. Joblessness has been focused in particular areas, especially this area of the Eastern heartland, which is this area along here, which starts in Louisiana and Mississippi, runs up through the area we call Appalachia and up into the Rust Belt cities of, of the North. And in some of these areas, more than one in four prime age men are jobless. And when you think about it, the great urban service economy means that you know, we can always imagine some entrepreneur finding a job for a less well-educated person in a city, Uber, working at a restaurant, doing something in the service, service sector, but what in the world are they gonna do in the lower density parts of America once the manufacturing jobs and mining jobs are all completely gone? Um, and the, one of the troubling aspects of this is, is that it is incredibly persistent. This shows the relationship between the share of the population that's not working in 1980 and the share of the population that's not working in 2010. And as you can see, the correlation coefficient is over 80%. And the, and the coefficient in the regression is more than one, meaning that in some sense it's exploding. These are permanent pockets of despair. I write about joblessness more than income because joblessness is a much greater curse. When you look at unhappiness, when you look at suicide, when you look at opioid abuse, right, 
the jobless, joblessness is just a much more severe problem than earning a little bit less. This, you can see the geographic pattern of opioid consumption in the US, which is also disproportionately high in the Eastern heartland. This just shows unhappiness. And as you can see, the, the share of people who say that they're unhappy, it gets higher as you get poorer, but then it leaps up when you're jobless. Because of course, being employed isn't just about earning, earning a living. It's about having a sense of purpose in this life. And it's about a sense of social connection, all of which comes from one's work. It's often depicted as if prime age men who are not working are taking care of their families. Um, that's just not so. Uh, there, there may be a few men who are doing that, but if you look at what's happening to non-working men, this compares working, not working, just look at the Eastern heartland, for instance, you've, you've gained about six hours a day from going from working to not working. And of that, about the majority of it has gone into watching TV, a little bit has gone into computer use. How much time are they spending caring for others? Well, a whopping nine minutes more they're spending caring for others on, on, on average relative to the working. working. Uh, so women are really different on this and it's just a very different, a different population. Um, and this just shows the share of the population who are living with their parents. So about 30% of prime age men who are not working are living with their parents. And that points to the importance of the housing problem that they, you know, their parents are living in Appalachia or in Mississippi and they're getting free space living there and they can't afford to move into San Francisco or New York. Now this, you know, the rise of joblessness has led me prior to um, COVID-19 to rethink place-based policies. So there were three good reasons for thinking about place-based policies, whether or not in the European Union or in the United States. One of which is there may be some efficiency gains from moving skilled people from one area to the other. Um, that is possible locational economics is full of externalities, but I don't believe we really are ever going to know the shape of these externalities well enough to know whether or not you want to move the skilled from, you know, Dublin into rural Ireland and from rural Ireland into Dublin. I think that's an impossible thing for us to know, even though we think skilled people are going to be a benefit to both areas. The second case for place-based redistribution is insurance. So Boston and, and Detroit had about equal incomes in 1969. Now Boston is 40% is richer. Maybe we want to take a little bit away from Boston and give to New York just as a way of, of insuring people. We don't have a lot of local, uh, local variation in income that's driven by place, though. And so that, that, that's not going to achieve a huge amount. The best case is that different local conditions call for place-based targeting. So not necessarily place-based redistribution, but different parts of America have very different labor markets. And so it's one thing to have a $15 minimum wage in Seattle, where it's not going to do very much harm. It's another thing to have a $15 minimum wage in West Virginia, where it will be, I believe, fairly catastrophic for local housing. Um, now, this evolution, this, this, this evolution to urban service jobs, which I think provide the best source of, of a future, an economic future for people in, uh, with less education, has also made us unusually vulnerable to an airborne pandemic. So now I am going to take us back to the Black Death. Um, the, the Black Death was a human catastrophe, roughly a third of Europe's population killed in a short period of time. Um, but it was not an economic catastrophe, because in a subsistence agricultural economy, when the amount of wealth is fundamentally amount about the amount of land per capita. And when you kill off a lot of people, you have a lot of land left for the people that are, who are still around. And so after the Black Death strikes, you have this huge burst up in wages, a huge amount of luxury spending as workers got richer, which then fueled the urban renaissance of the 15th century. Flash forward to the industrial economy of 1918, 1919, when sure, the influenza pandemic temporarily shut down the coal mines, temporarily shut down some factories. But as soon as it passed through, the factories were up and running again because customers weren't afraid of getting the disease from their coal or from their ice boxes. Move 100 years later. The ability to serve a cappuccino with a smile has been an employment safe haven as the factories disappeared. And yet those jobs can vanish in a heartbeat when that smile becomes a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. And that's exactly what we saw in the early days of the pandemic. So this just shows the evolution of American employment. The blue line that starts at the top and ends at the bottom, those are industrial jobs, which really vanish. It's not that America doesn't manufacture things, but we don't manufacture things using very much labor. The yellow line that's rising and the medium blue line in the middle, that's leisure, hospitality, and retail trade. The great urban service industries, which in 2019 employed one-fifth of Americans, 32 million workers, and this was the most vulnerable set of industries to the pandemic. The top two lines, professional and business services, these are the lucky ones who are able to still zoom their way to their work as an accountant or a lawyer. And the green line, which is education and health services, these were many of the frontline workers, but they did have their jobs, largely because they were backstopped by the government. 
early on in the pandemic, before America started spending trillions of dollars to bail out our small businesses, uh, we had um, unbelievable numbers of small business closures. This came from a survey that we ran around April 2020, where 45% of our small businesses were closed, huge industrial variation, 19% closed in banking and finance, 70% closed in arts and entertainment, 86% in personal services, like being a masseuse. So it really looked like a small business Armageddon. And 37% of those small businesses thought that they would be closed still in December. Now, this was before we spent trillions on the Paycheck Protection Program, which may or may not have been worth its incredible price tag, but it did certainly keep small businesses afloat. Now, one of the big questions for cities going forward is, will the burst in remote work become permanent? Um, now, this is not the first time that people have asked this. This just shows the decline in the number of people going to work during the early months of the pandemic. In 1980, Alvin Toffler, the futurist, wrote a book called The Third Wave, where he very much predicted that remote work, the technologies of his day, right, would make cities obsolete and would make the offices disappear and would make everyone work from home. Now, in some sense, his writing was natural because he lived in a great centrifugal age. There's always a dance between technology and cities. Some ages, like the 19th century, are unambiguously centripetal, like all the forces are drawing us together. New technologies like the streetcar and, and the skyscraper are pulling us into big urban areas, which are then expanding. Through the middle decades of the 20th century, the forces were much more centrifugal, where cars and then televisions and radios were enabling transportation over longer distances, they were enabling mass suburbanization, they were enabling us to enjoy the pleasures of an urban uh, music hall in a far-flung farm, right? And so Toffer is writing right after all of these tools of globalization had clobbered the urban industries of New York, where he, was, where he started his work, right? So um, the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not car production in Detroit, it was uh, garment production in New York City. This industry was clobbered in a few short years by globalization. Um, and he was then asked, why didn't these things, right, the fax machine, the personal computer, why didn't they clobber the urban service industries like publishing and financial services? And of course, exactly the opposite happened over the next 40 years. The urban service industries boomed, fueling an urban renaissance. And far from looking like a world of home offices, it looked like the world was going to be more connected than, than ever in a face-to-face -face, uh, way. This is an image of the Wallace office at Bloomberg's, uh, Mike Bloomberg City Hall in New York City, which is based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg's company, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. And trading floors were one of the first places to bring their workers back live during the COVID pandemic. Because in, in trading, right, when you're trading securities, if you're a little bit smarter, you can make a fortune almost immediately. And so the returns to all the knowledge you can get are really, really high. And so the extra information that you get from being in the room where the buzz is omnipresent is really strong, right? This is the Google campus, right? Of all the companies in the world, why didn't Google send its workers home? It didn't do it. Facebook famously mandated that it wanted its fake workers back, right? Google bought a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan. Why? Because it recognized that creativity came from combination. Creativity came from connection. You know, anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject area. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying uh, to, to, um, is getting through. Um, we have these remarkable cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. Right? And, so for that reason, as the world became more complex, it was more valuable to be face to face. Now, what about during the pandemic when all of a sudden Toffler was, was, was right and we were all going home? Well, the short run productivity estimates seem to be great. We seem to be do doing many things perfectly well long distance. Uh, this shows the amount of, this comes from work of Natalia Emanuel and Emma Harrington who are echoing earlier work by the great Nick Bloom of Stanford who looked at Chinese call center workers. They found that when you send the call center workers home, they can just make just as many calls per hour as if they're, if they're at work. And so the short run productivity is the same. But both Bloom's study and Emmanuel and Harrington found something else that's more worrisome about remote work, which is the promotion rates were much lower from going remote, from the remote workers. And you can see this on this side. Here you can see the workers who were, this is promoted to mid-level, everyone was promoted to mid-level, um, promoted to upper level. These were the on-site workers, the blue line. This was the remote workers. About double the share that were promoted uh, when they were on-site. Now, what does it mean to be promoted as a call center worker? It, it means that you get to handle the difficult calls, the real pain in the necks. Now, how would you learn how to do this if you were at home? 
Well, if you're at work, you learn it by copying people. You learn it by listening to other people handle calls. How would your boss learn that you were good at this if, they were, if you were remote? Well, your boss knows by listening to you when you're around. And so the extra information that is so critical for advancement gets lost when we're not in the same room with one another. You know, Microsoft also told us that its programmers were perfectly productive when they were long distance. Lots of telemetrics seems to show that. But new hiring for, pro for programmers was down 42% between February 2020 and November 2020, right? Firms were very reluctant to onboard workers who were going to be remote all the time. They often talked about a difficulty of getting them enmeshed in corporate culture, teaching them how the standards of work were going to work. Um, this shows new hirings and employment. On your right-hand side uh, is for those jobs that can be done remotely. On your left-hand side is those jobs that have to be done in person. Jobs that have to be done in person, you have a big drop in employment early on in the pandemic and a big drop in postings, but they both came back fairly quickly. For the remotable jobs, no drop in employment, you kept on holding on to your old workers, but a huge drop in postings as we stopped hiring new workers to do these jobs. And so in some sense, it shows that, you know, Zoom just doesn't work for onboarding new workers in the same way. It also doesn't work for building new relationships. A really nice new study by Microsoft came out just last month that shows that teams are much less likely to leap across and form new connections during the pandemic. They have their existing relationships, they maintain those over Zoom, but they don't build the sort of new relationships that are the life's blood of creativity of our best firms. Moreover, Zoom works terribly for those people with less education. So this is from the you know, the time at the apex of remote working, May of 2020, um, about 50 million Americans had lost their jobs because of the pandemic. Around 50 million Americans were teleworking because of the pandemic. But while it was the less educated who were more likely to lose their jobs, it was really only the more educated were Zooming. 68.9% of Americans were working remotely in May 2020. Only 5% of Americans with who were high school dropouts were, were working. Only 15.3% of Americans who just had high school degrees and no college were remotely working. And so if you imagine a world in which it's all about remote work, that is a world in which we have, you know, left out uh, many of our, our uh, less fortunate citizens. Now, looking forward, I think I share this. This comes from some projections that were done relatively early in the, in the uh, crisis, where people really did believe that some fraction of their workers would continue working remotely. Um, and I believe that that will happen, even though I think that for most of our workers, coming back will be natural and normal and that they're looking forward to it. Um, but that does mean, and I, I want to be clear about this, as optimistic as I am about the long-run future of cities, cities are likely to be in for a rough half decade, uh, if not longer. Now, in some sense, there are two paths going forward, one of which is this Delta variant goes on for another five years, maybe it becomes more deadly, maybe we get another new pandemic within the next decade. That's a really bleak picture, both for our cities and for all of our urban face-to-face -face jobs. Um, uh, that's, that's a future which it is worth spending unbelievably large amounts of money to try and make sure it doesn't happen. I'll just say something about that in a second. But even if that doesn't happen, um, the shock will be real, the combined shock of telecommuting and the pandemic, and that will still create shifts. In rich cities, this will mean that prices drop more than vacancies explode. Commercial space is likely to be more vulnerable than residential space. Cities will still reallocate from the old to the young. And some people will certainly move to, some work will move to homes, some work will move to lower density locales. And cities that face political challenges, particularly around taking care of their least fortunate, will be particularly challenged post COVID. So one of the things that's crucial to remember is that there's a huge amount of variety in the cost of real estate. And let's say you can imagine 20% reduction. I'm not putting much credence on that number, but imagine a 20% reduction in commercial rents. These are pre COVID rents. So let's say San Francisco has a 20% reduction that knocks them down to about $70 a square foot, which puts them down where, uh, you know, the San Francisco Peninsula is more generally. It will still be among America's most expensive areas, even with a huge correction. Even at that level of price, all those offices will be occupied. The same thing is true for pretty much all of the more expensive places on this, on this map. You can have a reduction in demand for office space, but you'll just get a reallocation. Younger businesses and younger people in, in favor of, of older places and financial service firms. However, these areas, the places that started closer to the margin of survival, where you know landlords were, ba were barely making ends meet to begin with, a 20% reduction in the demand for space in Detroit or Cincinnati or Cleveland, that can lead to widespread vacancies, which will then ripple throughout the urban ecosystem as empty offices lead to less demand for urban restaurants or other urban areas. 
Now, one of the reasons why it's particularly worth, worthwhile worrying about cities in the US is that there's a huge hunger for progressive action that was going on pre-COVID for understandable reasons, the lack of upward mobility, the high prices, and of course, policing, policing that, that targets uh, particularly African-Americans. Um, this is a hunger to do something. But if cities respond to that by taxing the rich, by taxing businesses, by treating them like piggy banks to be broken open, we risk a replay of the 1970s, where as you can see over here in this picture, you know, New York teetered on the edge of bankruptcy. And so cities need to respond not by engaging in massive redistribution, but by figuring out how to educate more effectively, by figuring out how to improve the quality of uh, our schools and to make our police more accountable, uh, rather than just by thinking that you can tax, tax the rich. The first thing going forward is that though we need to fix health. And so um, one of the things we call for in our new book, uh, Survival of the City, is that we need something like a NATO for health, right? We need something that is much more empowered than the UN's World Health Organization. We need something which involves real resources by wealthy countries that involves serious monitoring of the spread of disease, that does its best to even enforce quarantines when possible, that ideally engages in a great bargain in which we invest in sanitary infrastructure in the developing world in exchange for uh, a willingness to enforce rules that separate humans from animals and reduce the spread of disease uh, that occurred. Um, this is not going to be easy, but it's something that I think is absolutely vital. We had warnings of pandemic for 20 years before this. We had SARS, we had MERS, uh, we had H1N1, we had Ebola, right? And we ignored them. Let's not ignore this. This has been a terrible year and a half for the globe, and we really need to take steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. But ultimately, right, I, I want to end on an optimistic note. Yes, the twin challenges of pandemic disease and teleworking are certainly there. This will take some adjusting to for our cities. But cities have proven to be amazingly resilient. This is Berlin in 1945 and the Potsdamer Platz uh, today, right? They rebuild themselves. The long run of urban resilience, whether it's from plague or from natural disaster, is incredibly strong. And the demand for learning, the demand for cities to make their way, you know, to allow people to make their way in the world, that is not going to go away. And just as miraculous things happened when Socrates and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner, miraculous things will happen in the cities of the future. Thank you, Ronan. Hey, thank, thank you, you so all. much for uh, a really interesting talk. I, I might try to sign it as required reading for my history of the world economy <laughs> class. Uh, you managed to cover so much in a, a really tight time. Um, I won't take up any more time. What I'll do first is I'll, I'll introduce Alice Charles, who will be um, uh, presenting next. Uh, and Alice, you might um, get your slides ready if you want. Alice is project lead at the World Economic Forum in Geneva for cities, infrastructure, and urban services platform. She brings two decades of experience working for public and private sectors in the areas of city and urban planning and development, real estate, environment, and public policy. And she leads the WEF's cities and real estate work streams. She's also an external board member of NAMA, the National Asset Management Agency's Planning and Advisory Committee. Um, and she worked previously for Ireland's Department of the Environment, Community and Local Government, among others. She holds a Master's in Global Leadership from the WEF and an MBA from University College Dublin. So Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ronan. And just one update. Um, I've actually finished my role in NAMA very recently, so I'm no longer doing that. I think you have an old bio. So, uh, no problem. First of all, how do you follow Ed? Uh, I think I agree with pretty much everything he was saying throughout the presentation. So, uh, so that certainly will make for some consensus. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about some of the emerging trends in cities and real estate and some of the implications that will have. I'm get, then going to delve a little bit more deeply into what that means for different real estate asset classes. And then the final piece is just to tell you what I'm drawing from today. So we are an international organization for public-private collaboration. So everything that I will tell you about today is work that we're advancing with leaders of government, civil society, academia, and business. In the context of cities, of course, it's mayors primarily, and indeed with some ministers responsible for uh, urban development, as well as those that head cities teams and businesses and CEOs of real estate and engineering and construction. So first of all, um, we've heard a lot of this from Ed, so I'm going to be very quick in terms of what I say. We've seen huge shifts um, in our cities and real estate as a result of COVID-19. This has presented challenges, but it's also presented opportunities. 
And if we think about some of the behavioral shifts that we've seen, first of all, many of us have wanted more space in our residential accommodation because we've suddenly found ourselves working from home or we suddenly found ourselves spending a lot of time in this accommodation and realizing its inadequacy. The other thing we have found is that we have been largely working from home and we've also seen this huge shift towards e-commerce. But of course, if you lived in Asia, that was already a shift we had seen for a very long time. And we've also seen um, a lot less business travel, albeit some of that is starting to come back and the CEOs of the hotels that we would deal with are saying that it's looking, that customers are now looking for a different type of business travel where they're combining it also with family holidays and so on and so forth. Um, and we've also seen the affordability challenge has become greater than ever. We already had an affordable housing challenge in our cities around the world. In fact, the UN was already saying that only 13% of cities around the world were providing affordable housing before the pandemic. So the situation has got much worse. We also have seen a huge shift in terms of a drop in city revenues. And my next slide will show you a little bit of, of that in greater detail. We've also seen this demand in terms of not just creating buildings and cities that are resilient to the effects of climate change, for example, but also that address health and well-being. And that is definitely a huge shift that we're seeing. And we have seen the adoption of prop tech to a much greater extent. The real estate industry and indeed the engineering and construction industries were industries that lagged behind others in terms of the adoption of technology. But we have seen a bigger uptake in terms of prop tech, prop tech utilization during the pandemic. The other big shift that we have seen, indeed it had started well in advance of COVID-19, but it's really accelerated and mainstream during COVID-19, is this shift towards decarbonization. And whether that's cities, in fact, I'm just off a call with C40 and many of the cities that we work with, and many of them are part of the race to zero, where they're going to commit to be net zero carbon by at least 2050, with many of them saying they want to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030. Indeed, investors are following the same trajectory and they're saying they're investing in accordance with ESG. So that is requiring decarbonization of supply chains, of real estate, for example, of our mobility systems, our water systems, et cetera. And also, of course, because of the pandemic, we're seeing this um, wider definition of the term resilience. Resilience was more interpreted in terms of climate before the pandemic, but now it's recognized that we need buildings and cities to withstand the effects of financial crisis, for example, as well as health crisis and security crisis, et cetera. So, just as we um, think about cities in terms of what they want to achieve in the future, the, the focus is very much on how we can deliver a green and just recovery in our cities. And that's what we hear from most city leaders around the world. However, this is the backdrop. This is the reality in terms of their finances. So the worst best case scenario is, is really presented by the city of New York. There they've seen um, a deficit of more than 9 billion in 2020. And that is the picture from cities around the world. So for example, I presented some cities on that slide that normally bring in a huge budget surplus. And for example, Helsinki is one that generally brought in about a 350 euro bu budget surplus and similarly Melbourne, but they're also in deficit. And that is the picture right across the world. Why is that? They have seen their revenues drop in terms of parking charges, for example, in terms of toll charges. They have also seen property tax reductions, sales tax reductions, but at the same time, their expenses have gone up in terms of sanitation, in terms of health. And those that had large investment portfolios, many of them have seen decreases on their returns and investment. So the question is, how are they going to build back better? In fact, the meeting I'm just out of that we were hosting at the forum, cities were saying, we cannot even get um, investment from the financing sector for pre-feasibility studies to enable this green and just recovery. So um, the situation is bleak in terms of financing. But at the same time, there's this desire to create cities and real estate that is more livable. So recognizing we spend a huge amount of time in our buildings, how do we create buildings that are conducive to our health and our well-being? Also recognizing that the majority of the world's population live in cities and will continue to live in cities. But also we need to make our cities and buildings more sustainable, recognizing that our buildings account for around 40% of emissions. Of course, part of that is operational emissions in terms of energy efficiency, but quite a chunk of that is also related to embodied emissions. And that's something that's often left out of much of the debate. We also need to make our cities and buildings more resilient, recognizing our cities account for the majority of the world's GDP, but they are the most vulnerable to climate shocks. 
And finally, we need to make our cities more affordable. We already had an affordable housing crisis before COVID-19 that has got worse as a result of COVID-19. So we need to address that. So in essence, what we're saying is in terms of the work we've been doing with city leaders, leaders of real estate, civil society and academia, is we need to create cities that are more livable, sustainable, resilient and affordable. And that means cities and buildings that are healthy, that are of high quality, that are human centric, create smart spaces. We also need to decarbonize our cities and buildings and we need to make them more resilient to uh, enable them to withstand future shocks and indeed more affordable to be inclusive and accept, accessible, providing adequate affordable housing. Enablers of that are very much digitalization and innovation, of course, but regulation is also central. Also ensuring we have the talent and we, we value proof our assets and engage all stakeholders as part of that journey. So to create cities that are green and just, one central element is also to ensure that those cities are compact. So you cannot have a net zero carbon city unless it's a compact city. But equally, Ed, as an economist, has been alluding to the fact that if you are going to deliver infrastructure and services, it is much more sustainable to do so if indeed you've got a compact city. So here, if we look at the example of Pittsburgh versus Stockholm, so if your city wants to be net zero carbon, for example, you need to very much pursue the Stockholm model as opposed to the Pittsburgh model. In the case of Pittsburgh, for example, they, they are a similar size to Stockholm, but they use five times more land than Stockholm. They have five times greater emissions. And Stockholm is generally recognized as a much more inclusive and thriving city. Just to say, as um, I'm speaking to a home audience and, and an audience in Dublin, density is not to be um, misunderstood for height. In fact, um, what we are seeing in terms of a lot of, a lot of the evidence coming forward is that buildings that are of significant height, first of all, are not necessarily resilient buildings, but second of all, are they really net zero carbon? And the answer is clearly suggesting that they're not. So optimum heights are more around six to eight stories. Consistent density is what we need to achieve. And if you think about, um, if you think about New York versus Barcelona, you have much more consistent densities in Barcelona, for example. So it makes the delivery of infrastructure um, a lot more environmentally and economically sustainable in comparison to, to New York, which has high rise in Manhattan, but low rise in the wider boroughs of the city. So I guess what are some of the ideas being put forward by city leaders? So this is one that's been well publicized. It's got its many critics and I'll highlight some of the issues with it at the moment. This is the Paris solution. It's the 15 minute city concept. Many of you will have seen it over the weekend that the mayor of Paris is in fact going to run for president of France. But before she was re-elected as mayor, she put forward this idea to reinvent Paris in terms of the 15 minute city. And um, this is something that a professor that's an advisor to her called Carlos Moreno developed. And it's basically a premise that everything that we need to live, work and play is within 15 minutes of where we live. But whilst many think it's new, in fact, it's not. This is a concept that Melbourne has been working on for a very long time. And they, for example, have been very much focused on how they can create diversity of housing types. So how do you create spaces where people can age in place? How do you produce affordable housing options? How do you produce safe streets? How, how do we create walkable neighborhoods, neighborhoods that we can cycle in, neighborhoods that have access to local transit, also local employment, local shopping facilities, health facilities, education facilities, and of course, play and green spaces. However, what I will say is in terms of what is being discussed in terms of the, the Paris 15 minute neighborhood concept, little discussion has been had in relation to what is the future of the central business district. But also, if you are living in a neighborhood that's a very affluent 15 minute city, it's great. But if you are living in a less affluent 15 minute uh, neighborhood, if you like, it may not be great. If we think about cities that have brought about their revitalization, such as Medellin, what actually brought about the revitalization of Medellin was its ability to connect the periphery to the central business district and lift people um, who didn't have access to employment out of that situation and provide them with the employment that they, they so much wanted. Um, I guess in terms of what mayors are doing as part of the, uh, the most powerful city network, which is C40, which is focused on climate and it's funded by Michael Bloomberg. 
So here, 97 city leaders from around the world are working together to address climate change. But they've been very much putting forward this idea for a green and just recovery post-COVID. This group has been chaired by the Mayor Beppe Sala, who is the mayor of Milan, working with his fellow mayors around the world. So what they're focused on is creating a scenario where we do not return to business as usual, that the recovery is guided by science that we provide excellent public services in our city, that the recovery is equitable, that the recovery improves resilience in our cities, but also that the recovery leverages technology to drive a green recovery, that the recovery from COVID-19 is healthy, and also that we ensure that national government support for both cities and investment in cities is, is there. And finally, that we ensure the international and regional institutions invest directly in cities. The last two points are critical. I'm just up a call where cities were highlighting because, for example, the mayors are of a different political persuasion to national government, that national government is deliberately stopping certain projects that they're looking to bring forward for green and just recovery, and therefore they cannot attract the investment that they need from the international finance community. So that is a critical element for many cities around the world. From our perspective, we've been putting forward this idea of net zero carbon cities. And you know, whilst we are uh, asking for cities around the world to commit to be net zero carbon by 2050, the reality is that European cities are being asked to do a lot much sooner than that. And they're being asked, in fact, uh, I'll come to it in just a second, they're being asked to try and cut a significant portion of their emissions by 2050. 30. So what is a net zero carbon city? So in essence, what we're trying to focus on is how you can decarbonize your energy grid and your energy sources within your city, how you can create ultra efficient buildings, how you can decarbonize your mobility systems within your city, and how you can create compact cities. As I said earlier, you cannot and will not have a net zero carbon city if you do not address the compactness of your city. So it, we created a vision which we set out in January of this year that sets a pathway to deliver on that. Um, the European Commission, and many of you know this, and I hope the Dublin Chamber spends a little bit more time on this in the, in the coming months, they are um, asking for 100 cities to be carbon neutral by 2030, and they want all cities to be carbon neutral by 2050. In that context, they're asking that every member state is part of this initiative, and they'll be asking cities to enter into climate contracts when they embark on this journey next year. If you think about Dublin, that means all four local authorities need to be working together to come up with a comprehensive vision for how they're going to address climate, because there's no point in Dublin City doing so in isolation, given that they need to be working with Greater Dublin. So what does all of this mean for real estate asset classes? So first of all, I was heartened to see what Ed was saying, um, and I would say the office is not dead. Um, and in that context, there's a number of things that I'm going to draw on to point to that. So many of you will know John Moran, who's the CEO of JLL Ireland, and you may have seen his piece in the Irish Times a number of months ago, where he was saying, the office provides you with three Cs, colleagues, culture, and collaboration. And I think that is absolutely true. The second piece that I'm referring to is a piece by Carlo Ratti from MIT, uh, that other institution in Boston, um, uh, other than Ed's, Ed's wonderful institution. And he did research in MIT looking at communication before and after COVID-19. That was anonymized communication, but in essence, what it found was those sort of informal connections that led to collaboration. So you ran into somebody on campus, you ran into somebody at the water cooler, you realized you're working on similar things and you should collaborate. Those informal connections have been lost and we have largely jumped back into our silos. So if we're not having those informal connections and recognizing the need to collaborate, we're not going to innovate. In that sense, what has been said in terms of the future of the office is that the future of the office is hybrid. That means that we will return to the office for part of our week, but we, we may end up working from home for another part of our week. And indeed, I'm drawing on some Gensler research, which is the largest architectural practice in the world, which is suggesting that we will also um, work in more localized offices, which a variety of corporates may actually share, because of course, many of us cannot work from home. Our environments are not conducive to work from home. But either way, the, uh, in essence, we're saying 
the office is, is not dead, but it may require a change of layout to enable it to um, meet the purposes of the employees. Examples already exist of these types of buildings, and many of these buildings are sustainable, they're well, they're circular buildings, they're leveraging technology. And one such example is the Edge Olympic building in Amsterdam. I think what's fair to say as well is that these types of buildings are more of your, what you would call grade A offices and tend to command higher rents. What is different this time around is occupiers are very vocal about what they want. And in, in essence, the market is going to have to provide for their needs. In terms of industrial and logistics, I, I guess the shift in to e-commerce has been driving much of the development in industrial and logistics. And we're seeing a much greater demand for fully automated and cost-effective supply chains integrating the last mile delivery. We're also seeing a huge focus on creating sustainable buildings. And uh, for example, I'm going to draw upon an example of a little building in, in, in Finland, which very much demonstrates it. A final point is around livability. So we've really seen the vulnerability of many employees who are working in the industrial and logistics sector. So there's a greater desire to provide spaces that are more livable and can help prevent accidents and illnesses. Examples of these types of buildings, I meant the, sorry, mentioned the little distribution center in Finland, but I also want to mention the Okada center in the United Kingdom. So what's the future of retail? So there's much debate about this. I think if you were in Asia and for example, in China and Hong Kong before COVID-19, you would be very familiar with e-commerce. But even though e-commerce had a very significant presence in Hong Kong and mainland China, there was still an offline component. So people still like to go and experience a product. And what we've been um, seeing during COVID-19 is whilst we've had this huge shift to e-commerce, there has in fact been a lot of returns because people like to experience a product. So the belief is, and indeed the retailers that we work with are suggesting that certainly there will be in many cases reduced footprints um, for retail establishments, but in fact, the, this offline presence will be required so that people can experience a product. And we're already seeing examples of that, for example, at Majid Al Fulton, which develops a lot of the, the malls in the Middle East, are saying that they're seeing uh, many of their occupiers demanding less space. But the other thing that they are seeing is this demand for community facilities. And that is also present in Asia uh, within their malls. So for example, creches, uh, you know, places where communities can meet, et cetera. So they're becoming much more mixed use in terms of the types of facilities that um, they, they are demanding. So housing. Um, I know this is certainly an issue that receives much debate in Ireland, and I know Paul is coming next, so I don't want to steal his thunder, but um, the affordability crisis I mentioned was already a significant crisis before COVID-19. It will continue to be a significant crisis uh, post-COVID-19. Many of the common challenges in housing affordability relate to, for example, housing costs rising disproportionately to household incomes, which Ed referred to earlier as well. Affordable housing supply is not meeting demand. Scarcity of land, land is a very significant issue. Demographic changes, and also there's issues of energy poverty. Just to say, um, later today, I'm going to be on a, a BBC program, which is going to be looking at housing affordability. But, you know, I will be saying there that the housing challenge is not an easy challenge to solve, and you must look at the issue holistically. So you must look at the demand side and the supply side challenges that are contributing to your affordable housing crisis if you're going to resolve it. Piecemeal interventions will not solve the challenge. And when I say supply side challenges, they are broadly around land acquisition and titling, land use zoning and regulation, funding affordable housing, housing design and development costs. And on the demand side, it's determining eligibility. It's evaluating the purchase model, the rent or own and its credit financing. Just to return to a few of those. So if we look at the supply side, for example, in, in terms of land acquisition and titling, we often see that probate can result in a lot of stock actually being vacant for a very long period of time. And 
uh, aside from that, we also see that at any one point in a city, there's a huge amount of stock vacant, and that needs to be understood and addressed. If we think about Paris and Vancouver, they looked at their electricity data for their city to understand the level of vacancy within the city. The easiest way to address your challenge is to try and bring existing vacant stock back into use. In the city of Melbourne, they did it with water. They watered, they monitored water usage. And then they, in all those cities, tried to come up with taxation models to incentivize those buildings to be brought back into use. And if any of you are on Twitter in Ireland, I love to, to follow uh, vacant Ireland, derelict Ireland hashtags, which shows the, the level of buildings that are vacant in the heart of our cities and towns across Ireland, particularly heritage buildings that need to be brought back into use. The other piece is around regulation. Um, many of, of the construction industry, of course, would ask for a free for all, but that's not necessarily the way forward either. I think that what there needs to be is a greater consistency in terms of how policy is created. So, you know, when you look at um, housing policy, for example, village to village, town to town, city to city, country to country, there is huge variations in what is required. So if you speak to the house builders about that, they're saying, well, we cannot get to scale, we cannot get efficiencies in the sector, we cannot leverage prefabrication to the extent that we should because there is a lack of, there's inefficiency in the way the policy is created. At the same time, we also have a construction sector and a real estate sector that isn't the most inefficient. The land leases of this world, very large developers, are really leveraging the latest advances in technology to bring down the cost of construction, to also ensure that they're using less resources and, and meeting climate targets, but they're few and far between. In many cases, we have builders uh, building houses rather than developers. There's a lack of talent, there's a lack of efficiency, and it's something the industry needs to address. And of course, there are examples of how it has been done right. Um, we have seen Turin Taxi, for example, a major regeneration project in the center of Brussels, which has managed to provide a mix of housing types all in the one development and also created uh, developments that are sustainable. I mentioned Lendlease earlier. They have the, the Podium Digital Twin model where they are using digital twin technology to design buildings and leverage advanced manufacturing to produce those buildings. And they're seeing significant savings in terms of labor, in terms of resources and overall cost. So turning to hospitality and hospitality, um, we've seen urban hotels in gateway cities like Boston, Chicago and San Francisco have remained down year on year, although some of that is coming back. And their occupancy levels required to break even is around 34 to 39%. But in terms of re-emerging, those hotels are very much trying to re-emerge in reducing their overall emissions, providing sustainable buildings, which if, if they're able to reduce their operational emissions actually saves them a lot of money. They're also thinking about how they can reinvent their hotels. And that's particularly the case in terms of lobby spaces, for example. So, you know, they're often underused spaces. So how can they reinvent them, but also reinvent the wider hotel to be conducive for health and well-being? But hotels on the whole are pretty resilient buildings. And we know this from the great financial crisis in Ireland. Many of them are capable of being repurposed. So I'm going to finish up there and just say, um, you know, what I've been drawn upon today is our framework for the future of real estate, the work of our Global Future Council and Cities of Tomorrow, our Net Zero Carbon Cities Initiative, our Biodiversities Initiative, and some of our wider work on affordable housing, technology, the circular economy, et cetera, at the forum. Thank you for your time. Uh, huge thanks for that. Um, lots in there. And uh, in, in response to one of the questions that we got through, uh, we'll be doing our best to put all the material up on the Dublin Economics website as, as quickly as possible. Um, Ed has already shared his slides, uh, so we'll get that up as quickly as possible uh, for those who want to go through things in more detail, including some of the material that Alice mentioned just at the end there. Um, our final speaker today is uh, Paul Hogan, who's a Principal Planning Advisor at Ireland's Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. So in that role, he's responsible for the provision of professional planning advice on national, regional and urban planning policy, including the implementation of Project Ireland 2040 and contributing to the new Housing for All plan. He was previously project manager for the Irish National Planning Framework uh, and senior planner at South Dublin County Council from 2005 to 2015. And prior to that, responsible for the planning and initial delivery of the Adamstown Strategic Development Zone. He graduated from UCD with a master's in regional and urban planning and is a fellow of the Irish 
Planning Institute. Um, so Paul, looking forward to hearing your thoughts both uh, uh, independently and of course in response to anything um, you, you heard there and then we'll open up for, for discussion afterwards. Thanks very much. Um, I think if Alice had difficulty uh, uh, following Professor uh, Glazer, I think I've got even more difficulty uh, following both, both previous speakers. But what I would say is that um, I'm, I'm going to give a sort of a local policy context um, uh, for, for this in Ireland. And um, I think it, it's probably focused, to, to be fair, more on, on, on the future of, of cities and urban areas than it is on um, uh, work. But, but obviously, uh, the two are, are, are interrelated. So to make sense of this, I mean, I, 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 uh, I kind of took as a cue a kind of a, an amusing uh, um, uh, picture here that, that a colleague uh, had used before uh, to kind of come up with a sort of an ABC approach to try and uh, uh, make sense of it all. So it's really about, uh, from our perspective, you know, accelerated trends, things that were happening already. Um, the question of, you know, will we revert to business as usual or some form of a brave new world? And then, you know, my own observations about well, choice and, and the curated city in terms of how, how, how things are going. So first of all, A, accelerated trends. And there's been a lot talked about in relation to historic uh, shifts. Um, I know uh, that, 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 you know, what's happening now has been referred to as the Great Urban Reset. Uh, you know, change is, is, is something that planning is always uh, uh, trying to deal with. Um, and clearly the post-pandemic period is a step change in opportunity. Um, and the, the last major pandemic that, that, that uh, happened 100 years ago led to you know in combination with i suppose the after effects of of you know industrialization in the first world war um you know uh, the, really the the, the the widespread deployment of town planning and you can see there on the right hand side uh, that that, that publication is from the 1920s and you know was very prescient about um you know how things would change in the future and very influential no doubt so there are multiple underlying trends and issues that we have to deal with. And again, a lot of this has been touched on. Not, not so much climate change, uh, that hasn't been mentioned too much, but clearly digitalization, the impact on work, automation, um, how that affects retail commuting in the regions has been talked about. Um, and these are things that, that, are, that are really critical, uh, you know, anyway, but, but obviously the, their impact is accelerated in the last uh, 18 months. Uh, likewise, demographics. I mean, our population is growing, but it's dependent on migration to grow. And um, migrants, you know, tend to settle first in cities. Our population is also um, aging, and again, um, you know, there are, are logistical issues about, uh, you know, people's um, access to services and happiness uh, after a certain age living in, in rural versus uh, more, more connected urban areas. Um, as has been said, um, many of the critical challenges remain. Um, you know, housing affordability, viability and supply are absolutely critical. Not unique problems to Ireland. I mean, th this is a, a problem of all successful places. Housing has become uh, the, the biggest investment class in the world. And, you know, some of the most uh, unaffordable places are, are, you know, as you would expect, the most attractive to, to, to be in. Um, within Ireland, we have the, the particular issue of Dublin, its dominance, the implications of that for congestion and competitive, competitiveness. But also the question of who cities and towns are for, um, you know, even before the pandemic, there, there was a sort of a, a view that Airbnb and the prevalence of hotels in Dublin was becoming problematic. Uh, and now, um, you know, um, there, there are conflicts emerging about urban space and, and, and the, you know, on street dining the expansion of, of, of pubs and restaurants. Um, it's great when you're experiencing it, but it's not so good if you live there. Um, so all of this is now in, far, in sharp focus. And I suppose one of the most commonly used terms in the last um, uh, months was, was the word reimagining, um, you know, we're, we're, what will the new normal be like? Uh, what, what are the narratives that, that, that um, are going to emerge? I mean, there, there's obviously been a lot of discussion about the flight from urban areas. And, you know, if you were to read some publications, you'd believe it was, it was terminal and, and enduring, uh, but it is a boost for suburbs and regions. There's no doubt about that. But look, I, it's all been, been, been well, well uh, ventilated. Uh, cities and towns have prospered for millennia uh, and will lead the recovery, uh, but do face ongoing change. So the question is, will, what, what will that change be like? Will it be business as usual or a brave new world? Um, and again, it, it's been much, much um, described, but the value of social and interpersonal contact, and I would stress, particularly for us Irish people, is, is absolutely um, uh, immense. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we've had such a, a universal uh, uptake of, of the vaccine. People just want to socialize and get together again, you know, meet their families, meet, meet, meet friends and colleagues. Clearly urban areas are the most accessible and diverse places, focus for, for all sorts of activities, work, learning, culture, recreation. Uh, 
and they do facilitate collaboration and creativity. Again, it's been well described. But I also think the question of identity, culture and belonging are important. And you know, that, that's really important to us Irish people as well. The idea that, that place and proximity matter. I mean, where are you from? What county are you from? We all are familiar with that. Um, in planning terms, business as usual doesn't look so hot. You know, if you look at um, you know, very loose fit, uh, spread out, sprawling suburbs, you know, poor quality development, not supported by facilities, over zoning, and what that means then in terms of commuting and congestion, no one wants to return to that. So realistically, um, you know, we are experiencing, I suppose, you know, reactions to that as people, as people con contemplate what, what, what will happen next. And, you know, the phenomenon of, um, you know, 10 minute towns, 15 minute city is a form of kind of post-traumatic or distributed urbanism where people are, you know, uh, seeking hyper proximity and trying to build in a degree of resilience and purposeful redundancy to their daily lives. Um, you know, we, we've got all of these um, examples from elsewhere, but, but in reality, this is just a focus on the neighborhood and improved active modes and public transport networks. Um, I think what's going to emerge and what we're experiencing more than likely is a form of mixed use hybrid. And it's probably too early to define or to, to say for sure, but I think the best way to put it is that sub suburbs and towns will have to become more workable and will, will do so. And cities will have to become more livable. And it does mean changing um, uses for, 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 for land, uh, for buildings, and looking at areas and spaces differently. Um, you know, the, the, the traditional main street of a town may not, may not need to be quite so long or to have quite so many commercial premises. Um, you know, different focus on entertainment perhaps, but that then has those conflicts I mentioned with, with living, for example. And it does require regulatory and market adjustment, and that will take time. I mean, it'll, it'll, it's obviously happened relatively rapidly, but it will play out over the coming years. So what does that mean then in terms of choice and, and, and our you know, national priorities? Well, I, I do believe that our, our national plan is, is, is a framework that has been able to accommodate the sort of change that, that, that we're experiencing. I mean, the focus on regionalization is actually being, being given life through, through the post-COVID um, and, and, and indeed COVID um, experience, strengthening cities and regions outside Dublin um, relative to Dublin. It doesn't mean that we, we want to turn our back on Dublin and it's not the, the critical global driving force that we need. It just means other places have, have to um, carry some of that load and, and to be successful. And that does mean perhaps um, you know, changing where they, where they lie in terms of the value chain, both, both for, for the type of work that's there and, and, and possibly um, in, in due course, um, house prices, and we're seeing that already. Um, compact growth means leveraging the qualities of all, of all scales of urban settlement because, you know, for, for, for such a long time we, we've invested in these places, they offer the best um, uh, chances for, for, for providing housing for people, for, for providing work and opportunity, uh, and there's been so much investment and we, we, we can't afford uh, to, to speculate on, on, on investment everywhere as, as, as some would have us do. Ultimately, it's about quality and attractiveness and influencing the locational choice of firms and individuals. And as a small country, we need to be agile in that uh, within those kind of national targets. Um, right then at the other level of the scale, we, we've seen a lot of tactical urbanism over the, the, the last uh, uh, few months or 18 months or so. And it's been a great opportunity to experiment and experience um, you know, the influence of, of behavior change and to win public acceptance. Obviously, there's been some high profile wins, whether maybe losses, particularly in terms of cycleways and cycle routes, um, but also uh, on street dining and, and, and repurposing um, main streets. Um, but these sort of um, shifts will need to extend to things like densification and immunity. And by that, I mean things like um, you know, the ability to, to provide models of housing in, in urban environments that are, that are acceptable to, to the existing residents and not so focused on, on, on um, uh, you know, built around uh, high density apartment development. And, you know, we are facilitating uh, new design standards through um, revised settlement guidance, for example, with, with regard to density and topologies as one of our forthcoming um, uh, guidance publications. We're also very interested in, in, in enhanced amenities, uh, you know, to try and make uh, urban areas more livable. But ultimately, there's, a, there's going to be a lot of, you know, conflict and, 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 and potential choice about, you know, alternatives and how they may coexist, because, you know, we've seen some cycle routes have been less popular because they just displace traffic, for example. And that's just a small element of everything to do with planning, which, which ultimately comes down to choice. So I think, you know, again, uh, Professor Glazer went into this, and it's something that, that, that you know, I could have said a lot more about if, if there was time, but the pandemic really did highlight that the choice and immunity that people have depends very much on their occupation, um, you know, their location and their living conditions. And, you know, a lot of the time, 
Uh, it's down to, you know, the, the extent of overcrowding, the type of job they have, all of that. So, you know, I would say the 15 minute city works best with a pre 20th century urban superstructure, for example, in Paris, uh, for example, in, you know, where we've seen the successful to a cycle track in the Dunleary between um, um, Black Rock and, and, and Sandy Cove. Um, where there's density, where there's footfall, and also where there's a good social mix and there, there is good social cohesion, that is critical because the sort of the, the neighborhood concept has been tried and tested in many of our Western suburbs, for example, um, you know, with, with, with uh, you know, technical success, but not the levels of, of income expenditure and, and footfall. So really what, what, what I'm saying here is we must avoid, um, you know, reinforcing inequality in seeking to try and um, um, uh, provide that sort of 15 minute city. Uh, and, and all that it, that, that it means. Um, another thing that, that I think has become more prevalent is this idea of the curated city, the idea that city authorities and developers, you know, collaborating to a certain extent, but also, you know, whether they're doing, they're doing it together or separately, exercising great care about the, the use, mix and location of what it is they're developing and building. And this is really a really positive thing. It adds value choice and often responds to the needs of community or, or even creates it. Um, and there's, there's, there's usually as well the kind of ongoing maintenance and following through. It's not just speculative development for, you know, for investment's sake. Um, but delivery is key and making it happen. Um, you know, you do need governance. You need bodies like Limerick 2030. And also, um, you know, the, the, the national um, or the land development agency, you know, which through the Housing for All strategy um, uh, will, will see its, um, its level of, of, of um Money's allocated, or exchequer funds allocated, increased to three and a half billion over the next few years, um, and, and you know it's not just for housing; it's also for urban development generally. Clearly, housing is a priority. Likewise, the two billion euro urban regeneration and development fund, um, you know, has largely been allocated at this stage, and there's a huge program of investment underway. And we're also developing an urban development zone mechanism to try and focus more on on urban areas and how they can uh, be created to to that sort of. Um, uh, variety of, of typology and, uh, and also mixed use need. So in conclusion, um, you know, what I'd say is planning, um, you know, particularly in Ireland is necessarily dynamic and agile. Um, clearly there's lots of things to, to be addressed. Now, look, I'm not here to talk about the, the, the operation of the system or housing today. They are things that are ongoing, uh, but the pandemic is very much a driver of change and will accelerate things, uh, a catalyst for transformation opportunities. Um, but particularly focused on our national policies of regionalization and leverage compact growth. Um, so we will see more mixed use cities, towns and suburbs if we're successful with a focus on diverse walkable neighborhoods with greater levels of amenity density and footfall to create sustainable, high quality, connected, livable places. So that's, that's all I have time for. So thanks very much. Well, many, many thanks for that. Um, it's some very interesting material in there about the, the, the local context, as you, as you say yourself. Um, we have we have about five minutes or just a little under five minutes left. So um, my, my suggestion is that I, I quickly sum up some of the questions we have got in and maybe give each of the speakers an opportunity to speak on any of the ones that they have. And, and Ed has been uh, very good about answering them through the Q&A, but obviously it's always a little bit easier to speak than to type. Perhaps that might be a theme relevant to today's topic. Um, so um, I'll, I'll just pick three of the, the, the key ones that came through. Uh, the first was from Orla Hegarty, who asked um, uh, an important question around ventilation as, as perhaps the, the counterpart to some of the interventions around water at the last time around, and whether uh, there's any particular reasons that Western governments have, haven't really embraced ventilation as a, as a tactic against um, COVID-19, uh, and whether that might be um, ideological. Uh, Patrick King um, uh, related some of his experiences in, in, in visiting the US and wondered whether there's a, a difference between the economics around cities and the human behavior around cities, especially in relation to happiness. Um, uh, and then lastly, Andrew Kinsler had a, a question close to some of my own interests in relation to um, the narrative of urban versus rural. And I do think this is this comes up in Ireland that if, if Dublin grows, it's at the expense of somewhere else. And um, how do we frame a narrative? This is Andrew's question of that growth in one isn't at the price um, of, of growth in another. Um, so maybe um, uh, Ed, can I, can I turn to you first? If you want to, I know you've written answers, but if you want to say anything um, on any of those three, feel free sure. to do Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, you know, in terms of, of ventilation, uh, I think the litany of public health errors during COVID-19 has been just extraordinary, and this may indeed be just another one of them. Um, 
there is there are you know uh, ideological reasons to defer to uh, private decision making in places, but obviously when there's a pandemic, we need to have more uh, more government regulation in a variety of different ways. Um, the uh, I think the framing of a narrative in which cities and the countryside are seen are seen partners, or in the language of economics, complements rather than substitutes, is absolutely crucial. Right, rural Ireland does not lose when Dublin does better. Right, the, the strength of Dublin's economy enables those those areas to prosper. And in fact, even having more people living in compact spaces like uh, like Dublin means less pollution in lower density areas, and that's that's an added uh, asset of that. And I think Alice's uh, presentation was was just terrific on on this point um finally the um on the 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 third one which was uh the i think it was to do with the disconnect maybe between economics and, and, oh, and happiness yeah so i i think of the um i actually don't think of wealthy world urbanites as being particularly less uh, happy i think the data is sort of mixed although countries clearly differ i mean in new zealand and in italy there is clearly a rural happiness edge in sweden there's an urban happiness edge uh perhaps because of the excellent functioning of stockholm that alice has already uh, alluded to um I think some part of that is probably cultural. I mean, even though New Yorkers say that they're less satisfied with their lives, um, they actually are much less likely to commit suicide than people in, in low density areas. So that may well, anyone who's ever watched a Woody Allen film could should probably realize that to, a, to any self-respecting New Yorker telling a pollster that you're completely satisfied with everything is sort of downright unpatriotic to the city. Um, but I wanna end with just, uh, just by, by further uh, putting a nail in the coffin of 15 minute cities. So I think the whole point of metropolises is to connect everyone. I think successful cities are ones in which people are drawn not just to their neighborhood, but to the whole city. And when I hear a 15 minute city, I hear ghetto, I hear segregation, I hear slum. And the last thing I think the poor children of America cities need is to be told, oh, you're supposed to stay within your 15 minute area and not go to where the rich white people live. That's that's pretty much what I hear when I hear 15 minute city, whether or not that's about the you know American slums or about the banlieues in Paris being cut off. And I think it's actually the last thing that we want. Co looking forward, we should hope for a city that is more universally connected, not a city that is siloed into small neighborhoods. Thanks very much, Ed. Alice, do you want to follow up on any of those questions? Um, so on the ventilation point, I think one of the things that um, I had certainly seen in the real estate sector was this drive towards creating well buildings. And admittedly, it was the most progressive builders that were saying, we want to deliver buildings that are net zero, that are circular, that are well um, before COVID-19. The, the wellness issue and the well certification is something that I'm seeing mainstreaming in the real estate sector. However, governments haven't caught on to that yet. And just to say the International uh, Well Building uh, Council is very much focused also on how to create well communities and well cities. And I'd really encourage policymakers to take a look at that. And also, I think it is worth remembering that, you know, I'm an urban planner by background, but essentially our discipline emerged from um, taking planning for our health and our urban environment serious from previous pandemics. And we need to learn from that. On the rural um, urban thing, it's it's very much something I encounter a lot in Ireland, but it's something I don't encounter in a lot of other places. And, you know, I recently, for example, was part of a commission that was set up by Belfast City Council where they brought, uh, you know, leaders of business, government, civil society, um, academia, uh, together with international experts to try and come up with a strategy to drive inclusive and innovative growth in the city of Belfast. And we, as part of that commission, very much recognize that Belfast City is the engine of Northern Ireland's economy in the same way cities in the Republic of Ireland, like Dublin and Cork and Limerick and Galway, are the engines of the economy in the Republic of Ireland. So if the urban area doesn't do well, rural areas don't do well. So, you know, rather than a, a, a sort of divide, the two need to work together. Um, and, and, and from a sustainability point of view, it makes sense to create more compact, uh, you know, urban environments. Um, but it's also economically, it makes sense. You know, if you think about on post trying to deliver post in rural Ireland versus on post trying to deliver post uh, in central Dublin, there's a very significant cost difference. And that is the same for every type of infrastructure and service. So, you know, it makes sense in terms of having people concentrated in urban environments. And of course, we want to come together as humans. On the happiness piece, just to agree with what Ed was saying, we humans want to come together. And in, in that context, we, we tend to flock to cities because we want to meet other humans and other talents that are similar to us, et cetera, people of similar identities to us. 
On the 15 minute city concept, you know, it has got a lot of publicity. Remember, uh, Mayor Hildago very much did use it as part of her re-election campaign. Um, but what I would say is to look very carefully at how Melbourne um, implemented its 20 minute neighborhood because it's consistently a city that is regarded as one of the most livable cities in the world. And whilst it promoted this type of neighborhood within its city, it did not um, you know, sort of lose attention in terms of the future of its CBD. And also it very much tried to make sure that it was creating inclusive communities rather than segregated communities. So again, point towards Melbourne rather than uh, what Paris is talking to because Melbourne has, has thought it through a lot more. Alice, thank you very much. And um, Paul, would you like to respond to any of those? I guess in particular, the one that, that, that strikes me is the tendency, as Alice mentioned in Ireland, to see kind of rural versus urban that might be different to elsewhere. But feel free to uh, to answer any of the, the three. Yeah, OK, well, I'll, I'll start with that one. I think um, like there are cultural differences and people are culturally comfortable, you know, living in a rural environment in Ireland, um, you know, versus maybe a suburban or an urban one. And I think there are still quite quite big differences here uh, from, from that perspective. Um, you know, I think the, the former city planning officer for Cork who, who recently died um, uh, mentioned uh, famously that, that what Irish people want in, in Cork uh, was a bungalow just off Patrick Street with a view of the sea. So, you know, I think people want it every way and that, that's not possible. And that, that's to a certain extent, the choices that we have to face. I think the serious point though, is that, you know, because as a society we've decided that, that we want somewhere between a quarter and a third of our population to, to live in, in, in rural areas, you know, that there is a question of, of, of having to bear the cost of that as a society. And that's something that we have to all be comfortable with, I suppose. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think we're, we're a couple of minutes over, so I'd, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for, for staying on this long, especially our, our, our three speakers, and in particular, Professor Glazer for um, uh, f uh, given uh, he's uh, had the long shift with the, the Canton lecture uh, and stayed and, and so diligently answered the questions on Q&A. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll all join me in thanking all three speakers. And we look forward to uh, welcoming you to future sessions of the, the workshop over the course of the week. Uh, we have the uh, the slides. We will, with the permission of all of the uh, presenters, put them up on uh, DublinEconomics.com. Um, and uh, we'll also be checking in around uh, posting the videos uh, as well. Um, so, so keep an eye out for that. We'll update it at future sessions. So I look forward to seeing everyone um, uh, at, uh, at tomorrow's session uh, who can make it. And thank you again for joining today. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, Ed. Thank you.